Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. I'm Andrew Perchuk. I'm the Deputy Director of the Getty Research Institute, and I'd like to welcome everyone to Unfinished Fraying, Processes of Exhibition Making with curators Lynn Cook and Thomas J. Lax. I said good evening and good morning because despite all the drawbacks of Zoom, we have in attendance people from every continent except Antarctica. Uh, and I should at the outset acknowledge that I am standing a few miles from the Getty on land that is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Tongva and Gabrieleno peoples. This lecture is part of the Beyond Borders, Beyond Boundaries series. And the last of that series will take place on June 3rd, uh, which will be a program entitled A Black Gaze, Tina Camp and Laron Brooks in Conversation. I'm incredibly excited by uh, this evening's program because Thomas and Lynn have been very generous to invite us into what has been an organic conversation, not the usual staged presentation that we have uh, in panels or conversations, but rather an organic conversation has been taking place from, between them over the years on subjects of exhibition making, art and the afterlife of exhibitions. And since it has been an ongoing conversation, it needs no moderation. So you only see me when we open things back up to your questions. And we welcome you at any point to ask your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and we'll collect them uh, and ask them at the end. Uh, the format for today's presentation is that Lynn will speak for about 15 minutes, then Thomas will speak for about 15 minutes, then they will have a 20 minute conversation amongst the two of them, and then we will open things up to your questions. I wanna remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded and that it will be available on YouTube in about a week. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Lynn Cook was curator at DIA Art Foundation from 1991 to 2008, where she curated a series of extraordinarily important and memorable exhibitions. She moved to Madrid to take up the position of chief curator and deputy director of the Reina Sofia Museum. And while there, she curated Rosemary Trockel, Cosmos, and exhibitions of works by James Castle, and Martin Ramirez, which he did with Brooke Davis Anderson. In 2012, she became the Andrew W. Mellon Professor at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Visual Art at the National Gallery in Washington, where she began research on the work of American self-taught artists for the show Outliers and American Vanguard Art, an exhibition which was presented at the National Gallery in 2018, and subsequently at the High Museum in Atlanta and here at LACMA, and she's currently working on the exhibition Braided Histories, which explores interchanges, affiliations, and alignments between abstract art and woven forms over the past century. Thomas J. Lax is a writer and interlocutor and curator of media and performance at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. He is currently preparing the exhibition Just About Midtown, 1974 to the present with Linda Good Bryant, scheduled for 2022, an exhibition so many of us are looking forward to. He was the inaugural recipient of the Cisneros Research Grant, traveling to Brazil in 2020 to research contemporary black art. He worked with colleagues across the museum on a major rehang of the collection in 2019 and co-organized the exhibition Dutch and Dance Theater. The work is never done in 2018 with Anna Janewski and Martha Joseph. He has organized other projects at MoMA, including Unfinished Conversations, Maria Hasabi, Plastic, Neil Balufa, The Colonies, 
and Stefani Jemison, Promise Machine. And previously, he worked at the Studio Museum in Harlem for seven years. So please join me in welcoming our guests, and first of all, Lynn Cook. Thank you, Andrew. Um, can everybody see, um, see clearly? I'd like to begin by thanking Andrew for the invitation and Thomas for participating in this program together with me. I'd also like to thank Jennifer de la Fuente and her team for invaluable help with the technology and the presentation of this talk. I want to begin by referencing the conventional model of curatorial practice, whereby the curator makes one show and on its conclusion turns to another unrelated in subject and perhaps also in exhibition typology. For example, moving from a mid-career survey to a group show focused on historic movement and then to a retrospective of a diseased artist. The expectation is that each exhibition is discrete, its format, format and focus predetermined by the given exhibition typology. But over the first decade, I've come to feel that exhibitions are not necessarily so circumscribed, especially if from the beginning, they stray from the conventional typologies. Residues and legacies take various forms, methodological as much as content driven such that they arc back as if the earlier exhibition contained unfinished business, prompting one to reframe it through yet another lens. I'll sketch this argument in relation to three exhibitions, two past and a third that I'm currently working on. The first of these, I have the first image please, is Rosemary Trockel, Cosmos, which Andrew mentioned, um, I curated while at the Museo Reina Sofia in Madrid in 2011. In lieu of a standard soup to nuts retrospective, which I knew from previously working with Rosemary, that she'd likely find of little interest, I proposed an exhibition that would explore the pantheon of artists and or artworks that peopled her imaginary. I left it to her to define how this might be calibrated. From her initial response, it was clear that she was thinking about what her current touchstones and reference points might be, along with the opportunities implicit in the invitation to explore as yet unexamined sites of intrigue and to offer recuperative homage to others of personal significance. The show came together organically in a loose dialogue in which each of us proposed works or artists for consideration. Though not formalized, the groupings, as I saw them in retrospect, were rooted largely in a trio of abiding interests of hers. One was natural history, botany, and zoology in particular, and our relation to other species and their creativity. The second was feminism and gendered practices, materials, and modes. That is, the crafts, and in particular, ceramics and textiles. And the third involved a slippage around the notion of the centered subject, the artist as singular, unique author and authority. To me, this slippage manifested in a variety of ways over many years, from her avoidance of an identifiable signature style to her prioritizing of drawing, photography, and textiles, for example, over painting and sculpture in their conventional terms, to a preference for the modest and the wayward rather than the assertive and monumental and not least to her refusal of interviews, lectures, public statements, artist writings and the like. The show included a range of artworks by several self-taught artists, botanical studies, glass models for invertebrates, canonical illustrations such as Audubon's great series, The Birds of America, and examples of work by once renowned artists whose careers were eclipsed, for example, Ruth Franken. And what you see here is an example from um, an image from the new museum installation in the two, three vitrines that uh, were made to Rosemary specifications. You see in the nearest um, birds made by American self-taught artist, James Castle, and it's fronted by a series of bronze guns Rosemary made uh, for the exhibition and the presence, this particular juxtaposition and others of her work. For the back uh, works by Morton Bartlett 
And in the background uh, on the left, you can make out a, a painting. It's a copy that she um, purchased over the internet um, of a Toulouse-Lautrec painting she particularly like and liked and to which she added um, a beauty's mark. In addition to this very diverse range of work, the galleries were installed according to different principles. For example, as you see, this is uh, one floor. Could I have the next image, please? There's the castles in greater detail and the next, Audubon, and a painting by Tilda, an orangutan who lived in the, in the zoo in the Rhineland, whose work, um, gestural abstraction, Rosemary purchased and uh, appropriated in a work she called Less Sauvage Than Others. And the next, please. And you see here a different form of installation on another floor in which there's a one-to-one -one dialogue between Rosemary's works, which are the wall works, uh, all made of yarn, and work by Judith Scott on the plinth, the abstract sculpture. And the next image, please. And you see um, in more detail an example of Scott's work and Trockles. Trockles is a painting made by um, affixing lines of yarn uh, in parallel across the surface. And the Scott is made from winding yarn over an armature of found objects to make abstract form. Scott may be known to many of you um, as her work has been seen more in recent years. She was born with Down syndrome and was also deaf. And she made her work um, while an artist on the program of the Creative Growth Art Center in the Bay Area, where she worked in a collective studio with up to a hundred other artists. She was the only one during the years she was there in the 90s into the early 21st century who worked with Jan and who made abstract sculpture in this way. So her, her work was developed um, on her own over a period of time um, in a very, um, individual form, uh, a signature style. Cosmos, I think, illuminated Rosemary's practice, her thinking and values, but importantly, it also proposed ways of considering artworks in dialogue based outside reference to intention, utilitarian purpose, standard categorization, and hierarchical distinction. Could I have the next image, please? Outlier is an American vanguard art, which was presented in 2018 at the National Gallery, it was based on several years of research while I was there as Andrew Mellon um, Fellow, um, on the interwoven histories of self-taught and vanguard American art. And I want to um, focus here on the gallery that um, is the opening to the exhibition and also the final space. It's the, it, there's an enfilade of galleries that take you from here through the suite and back to this point. And I was very um, concerned that this gallery should contain contemporary art because my introduction to the subject really came through uh, an awareness of work like James Castle's and Judith Scott's and um, an interest in why it should have come to the fore again in the early or, um, second decade of the 20th century and uh, what it would mean to contextualize it again uh, in relation to contemporary idioms rather than in institutions dedicated to self-taught art where it was mostly seen. And the, this first gallery shows work by four artists who are all women. They all work with um, materials, particularly textiles that are gendered female. Um, I think on first glance, unless you're familiar with any of the artist's work, it would be very difficult to say which of these artists had no formal academic training. In fact, two did, two went to art school to Yale. One had what anthropologists call fireside training. She learned to sew and quilt uh, through her mother and other women in her community. And the third, uh, the fourth, sorry, um, study, made her work at the Center for Creative Growth, uh, and that's Judith Scott. And the 
one of the points about bringing these works together was to say to viewers, if, you, if it's not possible to distinguish by looking at them, which uh, belong to which category, maybe these categories need to be rethought or at least held in abeyance. And um, with this questioning, then to look back at the past to see how uh, at two previous historical moments, the work of self-taught artists was brought into um, mainstream institutions and the terms under which that occurred and the kind of work um, that occurred at the, that time. Could I have the next image, please? Uh, for example, in the interwar years, in the 1930s, the Museum of Modern Art under the directorship of Alfred Barr um, was very proactive in supporting the work of um, uncredentialed artists such as Horace Pippin, and Pippin rose to um, great fame by the late 90s and early 1930s and early 40s, I was the most celebrated of African American artists shown widely across the country. And his work was um, could be thought of in relation to mainstream artists who were involved in various kinds of primitivizing, such as Marston Hartley, whom you see on the right, uh, in terms of similarities in stylistic and formal concerns. And so there was a, an equivalence, uh, an absence of segregation and hierarchical distinction in that period that was uh, very short lived and disappeared as their work did from mainstream institutions uh, after the war. Next, please. And uh, in a different way, the same happened with Janet Sabel, but I think for interest of time, I'll move on. And the next, please. And the third example is um, this exhibition, Braided Histories, which Andrew also mentioned which um, again comes out of present concerns, out of uh, my um, awareness of an efflorescence, as I see it, in um, contemporary art practices which are engaged with um, textiles and with weaving in particular. And I um, find the most um, compelling work to be organized in relation to three sets of questions. One of these, which uh, you see on the left, is Ikshan Adams' um, woven tapestry, which is based on um, uh, linoleum flooring from uh, residences in the community in which he grew up as a young colored man in a township on the edge of um, Cape Town in South Africa uh, during the apartheid eras. And there he learned to sew, to make clothes and uh, an appreciation of textiles from his aunts and grandmother who brought him up. And this interest resurfaced uh, after he finished uh, art school training and led him in um, the body of works like these that are wall-based large-scale tapestries to bring together uh, references to these worn um, and, and worn out pieces of linoleum and remake them as weavings from um, not high, high quality, expensive uh, yarn, but um, cord and beads and other everyday materials, but adhering to the patterns of the original linoleum, which um, one could link back to designs from the arts and crafts movement, but further back for, to um, Islamic uh, art and carpets and tile work. Uh, and equally, attention is given to the worn pattern, the irregular surface, which in this work is, is um, brought out in gold thread so that it's held in tension um, with the underlying pattern. And I think in this play between the template, the linoleum that he starts from and the um, personal associations it has, the great histories of carpet making and tapestry in um, not only Islamic culture, but in the West and in the tensions between um, the, the valued and the, um, the repaired 
uh, one might also make associations with something like the Boro textiles of Japan, where wear and fracture and erasure, the humble and the worn, are transvalued into the meaningful and the important. And then on the right, uh, there's a work by Analia Saban, a copper tapestry in which the hard to read design, abstract design, is based on a micro processor, microchip of importance within the histories of um, computer, computing and technology, digital technologies. And, and of course, part of the background to this um, dialogue between the tapestry and the digital technology has to do with the relationship between the womb, uh, the loom and the computer and the um, way in which the, the automated jacquard weaving was um, a precursor to um, the early computer. And the next, please. And the third area would be issues of labor that come with the outsourcing and offshoring of manufacturing of cloth and uh, clothing from um, countries like the US uh, and Western Europe to places like um, China and Southeast Asia, where low wages, um, dangerous and uh, working conditions, uh, exploitative labor laws uh, or lack of labor laws and environmental depredation are all um, an outcome of these um, practices. Which, which include not only the fabrication of cloth, cloth but um, the making of fast, what's called fast fashion, uh, cheap and quickly changing fashion. Uh, and these economies, both the cloth and the fast fashion are now amongst the major components of the GMP of many countries, including the US. So it's these issues that I think are driving some of the most interesting work being made, as I said, um, by younger artists with um, um, interested in textiles and textile making. But of course, they're very different in some ways from the um, kinds of engagements that brought abstract artists uh, and textile makers together in the past. And I'd like to end just with one quick example. Um, Next image, please. Um, these artists will be familiar to many of you, Rosemary, uh, sorry, um, Agnes Martin and uh, Lenora Tony, who had uh, adjacent studios in Coenty Slip in downtown Manhattan in the late 50s and early 60s, where their work came into close dialogue as they shared certain concerns, formal concerns that had to do with the fundaments of the language of each art form, line and later the grid um, for Martin in abstraction and the thread, uh, the warp in, in the case of um, Tony as she invented techniques of off um, of loom weaving. And so the exhibition will um, move again from the present back through um, explorations of previous uh, dialogues as a way of framing some of the questions that I think um, can be can connect these two histories, the history of textiles and the history of abstraction. I do not want to collapse one into the other. But I want to argue that I think one cannot um, narrate a history of modernist abstraction without a constant reference to the concurrent histories of textiles and vice versa. So um, in making these comparisons, I, I've ground this down to um, a, a kind of a, in a reductive way, but I hope um, in order to up the ante and to think about what the afterlife of exhibitions might be one from the next within uh, a, a single uh, curator's practice. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I want to thank Andrew Perchuk for your warm introduction um, and also our conversation over the last uh, several months. Uh, thanks also 
to Jennifer De La Fuente for your insights in preparation for tonight's program, as well as to Adrian Cesaris, Ronald Bunny, Bill King, and Chris Young for holding this technological space across our various Zoom screens. Um, I'm going to share screen. And I'm hoping you all can see our title screen here. I'm gonna assume either Andrew or Jen would come on if not. Um, so um, I'm speaking to you tonight from unceded lands of the Wanapog peoples and wanna acknowledge and pay my respects um, to the Wapanog ancestors as well as to the present and future generations uh, of this homeland um, and throughout the Wapanog diaspora. Um, this acknowledgement is a commitment to the process of addressing the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and to actively work to dismantle them. Uh, thank you, Lynn, for this invitation to speak with you tonight. Um, it feels, uh, yeah, many months that we've been in this conversation, many years really that we've been in this conversation. Um, and um, I've learned a great amount in that time. Uh, and just to bracket it, um, to say something that I think many of us feel about your work, um, which is uh, that the rigor and care of your commitment to artists, uh, the expansive knowledge of the histories of artistic process and your fierce sense of creativity uh, is an example for, for myself and for many other curators um, of multiple generations. I'm very grateful uh, that when you received this invitation from the Getty to speak about your work, you in turn extended this invitation to me to be in dialogue with you and no less to speak about um, my own practice, which of course um, has been indelibly shaped uh, by your model. So I, I say that by way of acknowledging my indebtedness um, uh, to you and, and joy also um, in uh, being in this conversation. So I'll begin my remarks um, by invoking a, a method of storytelling um, related to this uh, proposal that you've put forward of uh, the, the net uh, that I learned from the science fiction writer Ursula K. Le Guin in an essay that she wrote in 1986 titled The Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction. And in this uh, funny and brilliant short essay, Le Guin makes the argument that culture and our means of sustenance not only mirror one another, but are one and the same, culture and sustenance. And she argues in her essay that in the temperate and tropical regions where hominids first became humans, the principal food that those people ate was not meat, but as she describes it, quote, vegetal uh, in nature, seeds, roots, sprouts, shoots, leaves, nuts, berries, fruits, and grains, adding bugs and mollusks and netting or snaring birds, fish, rats, rabbits, and other tuskless small fry to up the protein. Once gathered and before they were eaten, these forms of nourishment had to be kept somewhere. They needed a receptacle or recipient to hold them for the future some kind of what she calls sling or net carrier. The stories Le Guin told were decidedly not about what she calls the quote, sticks, spears, and swords, the things to bash and poke and hit with, the long hard things, end quote. Rather, the stories she told were of tiny grains, of things smaller than a mustard seed, stories which required a carrier bag to be able to change shape or to stay on the move or to fill to the brim, a mode of emplotment up to the task. And this is the kind of storytelling that I hope to do with artists and the kind of narrative of curatorial practice that um, I aim to share here. In uh, 2014, when I was a curator at the Studio Museum in Harlem, I organized the show, When the Stars Begin to Fall, Imagination and the American South. And the exhibition, which developed out of conversations uh, with Lynn and others, attempted to survey the work of self-taught artists of African descent, asking how an assessment of their work 
had been linked to the closely guarded terms of entry into museum exhibitions and collections for all black artists. Um, so the kind of refusal or admission of self-taught artists was a kind of um, harbinger or uh, um, a kind of um, uh, 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 synecdoche of the stakes of, of racial inclusion. Um, and in particular, I was moved by the ways that artists, uh, both self-taught and formally trained, who were included in this exhibition, had created not only through their work, but in their larger communities, methods for displaying, caring for, and contextualizing their own practices. In other words, they had made their own surrogate museums, uh, whether in the kinds of invented spaces that you see here on the left, in Carrie James Marshall's Bride of Frankenstein figure and uh, next to her on, on her left, the bride has a little object label that says Bride of Frankenstein. Um, so Carrie effectively pictorially creates a museum of his own making, an image bank according to his own need. Um, or uh, alternatively in, in a different way, the way on the right in Patric Patricia Satterwhite's drawings, um, you see uh, domestic products that she designed in her home in South Carolina to be sold on the home shopping network. So here, the home is not only pictured, it's not only aspired to, um, but it's also the space in which art is made, but also um, it is its final destination, um, at least in her estimation. So the show attempted to ask an essential question that I hope um, can continue to animate what I say tonight and, and um, our conversation, which is how can a museum show up for artists and artworks that were not exclusively made for or originally welcomed by museums. And this question has stayed with me and continued to animate my work uh, in the work I've done since uh, I arrived at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, the question was on my mind as I worked with colleagues at MoMA PS1 on the survey exhibition, Greater New York in 2015, following another cue from Lynn and her collaboration with Douglas Crimp on their exhibition, Mixed Use Manhattan. And in Greater New York, like in that earlier exhibition, uh, we attempted to house work of artists who had made use of New York City as both a material and a context for their work, asking how the transposition of that practice or set of practices over time um, to an, a storied alternative art institution um, might be a way to historicize the recent past and also uh, create a context for thinking about the stakes of art making um, for artists living in the city in the present. Um, Lynn made, as I mentioned, Mixed Use Manhattan with our mutual friend, the late Douglas Crimp, uh, one of the four curators for Greater New York and who you, whom you see here in Fire Island. And his work, um, specifically his commitment to exceeding the institutional boundaries set upon art criticism, history and making, uh, continue to animate my work and so many others. Uh, it perhaps goes without saying that the net or the carrier bag that I'm speaking about tonight is held by many. Um, and also uh, there's no better place to go fishing than near the ocean. When I arrived at MoMA, I was excited and, and, and uh, challenged to write a history of black and feminist institution makers. Um, those folks um, who had well before uh, majoritarian institutions like the Museum of Modern Art uh, had embraced diasporic black art, um, had set a kind of model or example and without whom, without whose pathfinding work, um, the kind of catch up that places like MoMA were engaged in would not have been possible. In other words, attempting to historicize the moment that we were in as I arrived at the museum, the terms of my hire effectively, um, by looking to um, those folks who had come before in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, this has guided my work with colleagues, including the collection displays that I've worked on, um, like this one titled Unfinished Conversations, which finds its own way, of course, into our our, the title of our, our um, event tonight, um, and itself took its name from a quote by the Jamaican born Stuart Hall, um, who you see pictured in that portrait in the center here. Uh, at the core of this show was a three channel video dedicated to Hall made by the black British artist, John Acomfra, Lena Gopal and David Lawson, um, which situated his life, um, his arrival um, from Jamaica to the UK as part of the Windrush generation um, within the history of um, both warfare uh, and the aerial bomb that you see on the right, um, as well as of um, gospel music and, and the voice of Mahalia Jackson you see on the left. 
Um, during his life, Hall helped to build multiple kinds of institutions, including the culturally specific Innova in London, um, and also worked as one of the few black folks on the program staff that helped to bring forth the Tate Modern in the early 2000s. Um, and he, as a Marxist cultural theorist, argued for culture as being part um, of a revolutionary process, that revolution is effectively a narrative of cultural change, um, and one that cultural institutions could play an active role in, something that I think is uh, quite difficult for institutions uh, today to uh, grapple with. Um, one exhibition uh, named after Hall uh, that I'm describing Unfinished Conversations brought together multiple works um, in which this kind of revolution was transpiring. So works that um, were themselves playing with this kind of um, revolutionary uh, spirit, including the work by the Northeast Brazilian artist, Jonathan Dandraje, The Uprising, in which uh, a fake uprising is held in order to create um, a kind of real uprising, um, as well as a selection of work by the New York-based artist, Cameron Rowland, in sculpture and contracts that you see on the right, um, which through a complex arrangement, engage cultural institutions uh, relationship to the long tail of involuntary servitude um, through the prison industrial complex. Closer to home and, and shifting gears um, slightly, uh, this search, as I've mentioned, to write a history of feminist institution builders led Anna Yanevsky, Martha Joseph and me to organize the exhibition Judson Dance Theater, The Work Is Never Done, um, another unfinished promise, um, which attempted to situate this landmark postmodern dance assembly of transdisciplinary artists who self-organized workshops and performances in a basement gym at Judson Memorial Church, um, which you see here, um, those lines of the basement gym in a performance by Yvonne Rayner. And our goal as curators was not only to describe um, these mainly women choreographers, um, uh, was actually not not at all um, meant to describe these mainly women choreographers as progenitors of male sculptors, as many um, important art historians had done before us, but rather to ask what had preceded them, um, what had become the kind of conditions of possibility that allowed for their experimentations and collaborations to take place, and looking specifically at the history of avant-garde jazz, um, high camp, um, balletic. Um, theater and eco-critical improvisations as the sets of activities in the 50s, late 50s and early 60s that had led to this moment. And um, I'll, I'll just say um, thank you to the Getty um, for the loans to this exhibition and, and also for the care of the work of several of these artists um, in their collection. So the show narrated um, how this history was situated actively in the present it was not something that existed cordoned off and in the past, but was actually um, part and parcel of uh, the way in which um, choreographers and performers were actively negotiating and retelling this history in their own work and in their own communities. And to this end, we invited Will Rawls, Martita Abril, and Andrew Sins Brown, who you see here, to interpret Simone Forti's important 1960s seesaw inside of the show in 2018. Um, and in their performance, they asked how Forti's interest in what she called a quote, domestic drama might extend to the active separation of children from their families at the US-Mexico border, effectively taking the ethos, the promise of Forti's work and through direct address actually in the performance asking her, is this what you meant when you said domestic drama? Looking at the kind of um, seams and also um, potentially for re potentials for retelling the kind of original intentions of this artist that they worked with um, to interpret her work. Um, the lessons that we learned inside of that exhibition have directly informed MoMA's broader history of modern and contemporary art uh, as told in its collection galleries. And, you know, as anybody who's worked in an institution at the scale of MoMA knows, um, to get to this retelling where you see 
Carolee Shaman and Cecil Taylor, two of the artists who are in our Judson show um, as now part of the narrative of, of assemblage that once was reserved exclusively to Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Dons. You know that this is the work of many, many people over many, many years, um, some of whom continue to work at MoMA, others of whom are elsewhere in the world. Um, and so hopefully this, um, you know, kind of extension out, this, this fraying um, can be uh, a form of um, collective celebration also for these two artists who um, passed in the interim between when Judson happened and, and when MoMA, um, when this gallery opened uh, last year. Um, so this, this kind of work um, of kind of thinking through what the history of, of various spaces that were um, organized either, you know, because they were completely illegible to the Museum of Modern Art and institutions like it, um, or just creating their own thing with no you know, real interest in what places like MoMA were doing, um, is animating the exhibition just above Midtown 1974 to the present, which as Andrew mentioned, is scheduled to open at MoMA next fall. And the project considers the influence of just above Midtown or, or JAM, um, a gallery and a self-described laboratory for artists of color that was led by Linda Good Bryant, who you see pictured here in a recent collage by the artist Lorna Simpson. And Linda was 23 years old when she opened the gallery. Um, in addition to being the mother of two young children at the time, she was the director of education uh, at the Studio Museum in Harlem, um, another kind of, um, full circle moment for, for, um, for myself and for her, um, as well as for the life of the project, which will have some components that are collaborations between the two institutions. Um, Linda now runs an urban farm in New York City. Um, and part of what we're thinking together through is how this question of culture and sustenance that I opened with um, of the art that Linda showed and the farm that she runs today are perhaps part of a shared project, a fair, shared um, kind of black feminist cultural project. Um, Sangan and Goody, uh, who you see pictured here, had her first New York solo exhibition at the gallery in 1977. And she has described JAM as a quote, vibrating space where artists were giving carte blanche and there were no restrictions. Um, I don't know if that chimes with many people's experiences of working in large institutions. However, a question that Linda and I are asking, um, and she you know, has phrased it in this way as a key collaborator on the show, is can JAM be JAM at MoMA if we understand what it is to invite um, Black artists in the context that they were a part of um, to a place like MoMA as inviting them in with no restrictions. And I wanna end on a recent project that I have supported with my dear colleague, Lanka Tattersall. Um, and it has really taken me full circle back to my time at the Studio Museum, which is Garrett Bradley's Installation America, which was organized by Thelma Golden um, with Legacy Russell at the Studio Museum. Um, filmmaker and artist Garrett Bradley uh, has been, began making this work when MoMA announced that it would, had restored Lime Kiln Club Field Day from 1914, which is believed to be the oldest surviving feature length film with an all black cast um, and which had been previously believed to be missing. MoMA's recovery, however, um, was an anomaly. Around 70% of all feature length films that were made in the first three decades of the 20th century no longer exist. And so when Bradley found this out in 2015, she set out to fill in this missing archive, working with her community in New Orleans where she lives and works to reimagine and create memories anew. It was always Bradley's desire to not work alone. Um, there's a massive collaboration that made her installation, but also um, to use her motivation as a prompt to invite others to recreate um, what is estimated to be uh, an additional 7,500 films that have also gone missing. And so my colleagues, Raven Ruffin and Issa Saldana, fellows who are working across the Studio Museum in MoMA organized a series of workshops with Bradley, her collaborator, Trevor Matheson and others to invite high schoolers and elders and other artists to make their own, as they called it, memories for the future. And to celebrate the closing of Bradley's exhibition at MoMA last month, they screened a selection of these films, um, which are now up on um, the, their website and, and MoMA's website, um, and invited Tina Camp to, as Andrew also mentioned, will be um, present next month, or in June rather, at the Getty, um, talking about her new book. Um, and so yet, yet another extension outwards into the future. Um, so for me, this, this model of collaboration um, is an example of how a museum cannot 
simply be a repository of history, but an active site where memory, um, this other category, more tenuous, more subjective, um, you know, perhaps more fireside um, as, a, as a kind of educational model, as, as Lynn described it, um, can be valued and out of which new interpretations and new artworks unto themselves can enter into dialogue about what was, what might have been, and what could be in the future. Um, so I'll invite Lynn back to um, join for, for um, a conversation together. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Thomas. Um, before we start talking, I wanted to thank Zoe Leonard, uh, whose um, lines, this unpublished work uh, she kindly lent to us to, um, as, as, um, as an image to accompany the uh, announcement of this talk. And for me, the image is very resonant in several ways. One, the title, lines, and the multiple um, meanings of lines, both in relation to sailing and and uh, of course, in relation to um, formal components of art making. And, um, but also in the way that these lines, the ropes, which are braided uh, textiles, are uh, um, connecting these platforms to um, something larger and more stable. But clearly the connections are provisional. They're not, written in stone, they're not going to last forever. And for me, that both the fraying of the cords, which will ultimately um, also break the connection, is as uh, important as the provisionality. And it, because I would think that as we struggle to write new narratives, which are more inclusive, which are, um, centered in the present as we look back into history, we do so knowing that they are going to be provisional. At best, they speak for our time and in relation to the art that's being made now and how that allows us to read art of the past. But generations to come at other historical moments will see it differently and uh, inev inevitably overlay it onto whatever we've done. So in that sense, I think our work is ever unfinished. But I wanted um, not only to say that, but to um, ask you, Thomas, and thank you. Many years ago, when I was first working on Outliers, uh, you were already far um, down the line in planning your when the stars begin to fall. And you suggested to me that I look at the work of Sadia Hartman. And uh, at that stage, I was not familiar with her work. And my entry point was really an, your encouragement and also an essay you authored with Catherine Gentleson on the notion of curatorial fabulations, which resonated very richly for me, uh, both into, in relation to work that Judas with Judith Scott that I was then doing, um, but uh, in an ongoing way. So both to thank you and ask you if you could say something about uh, curatorial fabulations and why Hartman's work has, uh, you thought of it in that context. Yeah, um, I love what you were saying, Lynn, about the provisional, because um, it also feels so marked in this photograph. Like there's just so much, even in like, this kind of like coming into the frame of this like mm -hmm. figure or um, finger or just context, right? Mm -hmm. Like just the the um, the the space in which it's it's shot um, immediately implying, which which just feels like this instantiation of what you're describing of like us authoring things in conversation with one another um, to be able to like account for the past and prepare for a future. Um, and so I like you, I'm really grateful to Zoe and, and also, yeah, this provision, like I'm just thinking this other definition of provision, like the, you know, like the thing that also we need um, like to sustain us. Um, um, so um, in terms of thinking about this critical fabulation piece, um, 
I think what we, yeah, we were reading, you know, um, I, yeah, just, you know, together looking at so many like different uh, artworks and like kind of stepping back to like, just imagine their, their processes of, of construction. Um, and I think, um, you know, because you were so generous in like talking to me as you were making outliers of like, actually, how do you um, construct the provisional history? Like what is the kind of exhibition methodology for marking that in the space of a gallery um, so that there's not that kind of museum effect as you've called it before, um, you know, that like one imagines what you see to be final for all time, um, but rather, um, yeah, a sense of on, ongoingness, uh, even as you're welcomed into a space. And so I think um, the, the text, um, Venus in Two Acts, um, um, which is in, in, in uh, Kalaloo for folks who want to read it. Um, and then that informs Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, which is Hartman's uh, book from two years ago. And we're looking at the cover of the UK version of it, um, just so so beautiful, um, this, this image. Um, and, you know, I think what Hartman proposes is in that book, a kind of what she calls counter fiction to the fiction that archives, particularly um, state archives, archives um, of, you know, um, social reformers, um, photographic archives um, for um, men who had, um, you know, predatory relationships to the subject that they pictured um, is a kind of alternative way of narrating the set of available facts from those materials towards a different end with a different kind of audience in mind um, and um, with a different horizon for the future that is insisted upon. Um, and I think, you know, both the essay that you mentioned um, and, and also your essay on Judith Scott, like take up that idea of fabulation, what if, um, right? This like subjunctive tense of imagine had this existed. Um, and also in that imagination, um, what I understand to be, you know, your deep commitment to, to actually, you know, like showing the receipts, as they say, like this actually did occur, even as it is um, a kind of fabulation, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of putting the pieces of the story together in a way that's different from um, the kind of fiction that's received towards creating another kind of fiction um, that has a different capacity, um, also based in, in um, you know, real lives, um, but differently motivated. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I guess, you know, kind of at, to, to put the question back to you, um, you know, are, are um, how, as you kind of continued to, you know, um, pursue this, this line um, uh, over these years, like what are some of the, um, the ways that, um, you know, the opportunities of um, the recent book that you are working on and, and um, you know, the, the other conversations that have come out of um, that process with, with other contemporary artists um, have informed um, some of, yeah, your, your, your own um, kind of reevaluations of, of you know, these kinds of um, historical moments in, in your own work. Thank you, Thomas. I think um, perhaps the most um, immediate example is an anthology of essays that um, will grow out of, we still haven't quite got there, um, a symposium that took place at the National Gallery in January of 2018 uh, that had um, contributions from art historians and critics and others from a much wider field than the um, exhibition Outliers in American Vanguard Art. And it was an opportunity to think not only about um, some of the subjects that never got into the exhibition, but to think about why some of them didn't in, in a sense. And uh, one would be to think about the situation with um, Native American work, um, particularly as uh, artists in the 1930s started to uh, transfer their making in onto 
um, paper uh, with paints from uh, working in more traditional ways on hide and so forth. And that these um, long cultural practices were recognized as both old and new in this new form and were taken up by white audiences um, who advocated for this work in, um, in a contemporary arena leading to some of the work being shown at the American Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, I think of 1932. It's uh, for all the centrality of artists like Horace Pippen and John Kane, for example, to uh, thinking about American vanguard art of the later 1930s. I can't imagine that uh, self-taught art would have been sent to Venice uh, as part of the American contribution to the show uh, in those years. I think that there's uh, very different frames that are at work and um, having uh, the opportunity to bring some of this to the fore in this second volume um, that's not uh, a catalogue to an exhibition but it's it's um, if you like a reflection in part on the issues that the exhibition brought up is is um, a wonderful opportunity and um, we're looking at an image here of um, which a particular project that David Hammonds engaged in as a curator, which I had known nothing about and you brought to my attention through a paper you gave at a colloquium that we were, I was fortunate to uh, be able to organize at the Clark um, during the research phase of Outliers when you and a number of uh, other colleagues, curators, art historians, artists, including Zoe, um, came together to, um, to critique some of my ideas and offer um, areas of concern and opportunities to think in other ways. And um, you in turn have kindly agreed to publish um, this material in this forthcoming volume. And one of the things that I'm very excited about, um, it throws very new light, I think, on David Hammonds's um, larger practice, but it also shows one in detail, one of the few instances when um, a vanguard artist not only advocated for the work of peers who were uncredentialed, but how that took form in an exhibition that his, in this case, his own work was included and in which he put himself in dialogue with that work. And really the only um, examples from this earlier moment that I can think of are a couple of exhibitions that the Imagist did in Chicago where um, Jim Nutt and Roger Brown on different occasions curated shows and built uh, an environmental or installation presentation in which um, they uh, invested themselves uh, along with the work of their peers. So this is a very um, rare instance, and I think a very informative one. Can you can you say more about how you became interested in it and what what it reson how it resonates for you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I have to say, like you know, it's this. Uh, part of the fray that you propose is like a way of acknowledging failure, like what we imagine to be failure um, as itself, like the terms for, like the basic terms for exhibition making and, and art making, whether it's like in very empirical ways of like, I wanted to show something or I wanted to write about something that, you know, didn't work out because, whatever reason, or an artist and, you know, kind of coming upon um, that form of failure and whatever terms they imagine that being like the terms of like what happens afterwards in, in their career. So I guess I, I say that to say, you know, I found out about this show in like 2013 in preparation for When the Stars Begin to Fall in which David Hammonds was an artist who, who showed there um, in, in that exhibition that I organized and you know, from there, there's just a set of conversations that that kind of were, um, yeah, made possible and thanks to you and, and that 
kind of symposium talking to Zoe and 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 Douglas and Ann Reynolds and, and others, um, and then going to talk to Tom Finkelpearl. So basically David Hammonds um, organized a show in the late 80s at Clock Tower Gallery, um, which was a kind of annex of PS1, now MoMA PS1, um, that you know kind of came upon the invitation of Tom Finkelpearl. Um, so as you said, it's you know something that kind of even though it existed in memory and um, you know in some photographs which I found later, um, there, there, it wasn't part of Hammonds's kind of reception. Um, so, I, you know, I had the chance to go talk to Tom Finkelpearl about this and, um, thanks to your encouragement, just continue to be steady and, and patient. And, um, you know, eventually Tom recommended I reach out to Ari Markopoulos, the photographer who had traveled with the two of them, along with AC Hudgens, a longtime friend of Hammonds to um, North Carolina to meet the artists who would be in the show um, outside Insight um, and ultimately, um, you know, gave me a sense of what their time in North Carolina was like. And so, you know, I think for me, thinking about David Hammonds who first showed in New York City at just above Midtown Gallery in its early shows in the early 70s um, and then you know, has this exhibition and then subsequent to that um, is included in, you know, Documenta um, and of course in your Carnegie International, like this is a moment right before he goes from showing in, as he would call it, you know, like basement churches and, you know, basketball courts um, to being a major player on the world stage um, of the contemporary art world and all of the things that, that the things that that brings. And so this, exhibition offered a chance to kind of think through how he was actively working through his own reception um, as he was kind of mediating or projecting it um, to the group of artists that he met um, who were all self-taught, um, you know, in, in North Carolina. Uh, so yeah, it felt very entangled to histories that we are both implicated in. And I think I see his gesture of like including himself as a way, you know, like that finger inside of the image or whatever it is like of, of just acknowledging that it's like things get messy and um, you know that's not what we're here for um, I guess yeah I don't know before we open it up to the the some questions I feel I, I in our conversations when I feel like something you have always done is just like think so um, expansively about um, you know the kind of um, historical present that we find ourselves in and you know why it is that we are having this conversation in this moment in this you know very um kind of uh yeah elite space um you know about um the kind of limits of elite culture um and also um it's um you know kind of self-reflexive potentialities and and I don't know yeah there 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 are a number of things that you've said just about the the why of now um, and I don't know if there's any of that that you're called to kind of reflect on in this moment I think more than at any other time that I've been curating the urgency of um, or the urgency to question what it is we put forward um, not to, even to the public, to our colleagues as um, material we want to work on, questions we want to ask, has, has never been more loaded. Um, the, what Suzanne Hudson wonderfully calls the dispensation of privilege uh, mm -hmm. that is curating, um, I think um, enjoins us to think more than ever about the grounds on which we choose to bring forward topics or um, bodies of work or questions and um, advocate for them. And at the same time to, uh, to think about not only who this, um, this institution is for and who will see it or who um, but how we represent the artists, how we are the artists' advocates and agents within the museum structure. And um, this is very complicated in the kinds of big um, multi-layered institutions we work in. I found the whole um, 
question much easier to frame and my um, activities much simpler to understand when I worked at Deer. And uh, I saw myself as Jana's faced on the one hand, um, being the artist spokesperson when necessary, when the artist wasn't present and protecting the artists and needs and facilitating their concerns. And on the other hand, um, working with the institution to see the um, to see how this could dovetail to um, the best uh, the best way forward for the presentation of the artist's work and the artist's ideas. And that's a very particular institution with a very specific mandate. I now work in a very different kind of institution and translating those those role that role in uh, at a different moment. This is the, also 20 something years later and uh, the questions are um, have a different valence right now. I don't know if I can say more than that. That's, um, yeah, I think you've, you've named the stakes um, and I wonder in the name of our fray if we might use this as a chance to kind of open our circle um, and invite Andrew. Andrew, hello. Well, thank you both. That was, uh, it went by so quickly for me that, uh, but in any case, let's get down to the questions and answers. Uh, the first question is to both of you from uh, Julia Bryan Wilson. And it is, can you discuss how you think about installation, display, and sequencing, particularly around issues of chronology and the unfolding or collapsing of time within the exhibition space? Lynn, do you wanna start? I think that was originally prompted by outliers and the and the juxtapositions you made there. Um, I, I would say that I, I see an exhibition as a visual argument, um, meaning, but not just a, a theoretical statement or a, an art historical statement, a statement that's made um, if, by works of art in dialogue, which therefore means that, that this um, argument is being made uh, viscerally and sensually and affect in terms of affect as works impact uh, viewers. And, and uh, therefore there's, there's um, ways of, and, and, and one's also looking, one can't program how a viewer will um, move from one object to another in a room or uh, one can set up cues, but there's always going to be a range of cross-cutting and uh, ricocheting around the objects within any space. And some of that one may anticipate in advance. I find that it really only comes together when the objects are brought into the space and ideally with time to move them around, to see them in different combinations, to see what is coming forth that one anticipated, but what other opportunities there are because the works have uh, qualities and qualities that are heightened in, in juxtaposition that can't, for me at least, um, be fully imagined in advance. And, the question of, of chronology, I, I think we always look at the past through the present. There's no other, um, you know, there's, there's no other uh, temporal framework. Uh, and to be as aware as possible of what being in the present means uh, in terms of the questions and emphases that are, that are going to um, filter what we're looking at in the past. Thomas, would you like to offer your thoughts? Yeah. Hey there, Julia. Thank you for you know, tuning in. Um, um, you know, I think that um, 
chronology, which I think is one mode of sequencing um, that imagines, you know, kind of temporal progression um, is one that is um, culturally specific, um, which is to say, you know, emerges from um, a version of modernism um, that is valorized and happens to be um, the valorized version and the place in which I work, um, which is to say that like, um, there's a kind of belief in um, the past and the present and future being perhaps more distinct than, um, you know, the way in which Lynn is describing it. I think over the last several years and in MoMA, the reinstallation of the galleries have allowed for there to be these kinds of folds in time, these kinds of incursions um, of different moments to touch upon one another, um, which I think are about um, histories of reception being perhaps foregrounded over histories of production um, with the understanding that, you know, as um, Lynn's projects have, I think, shown me and, and amongst others that like, you know, certain artists are making work that get um, picked up and, and made public um, well after the work of others because of questions of gender and race and class. Um, all things that I know you think and know, Julia. I guess the thing that feels most pertinent for me in this jam project that Linda and I are thinking through, um, and it's about this, like, how can you, how can jam be jam at MoMA um, is, you know, the conditions obviously for Jam's existence in 1974 um, are in some ways radically different than, you know, why we would have a show of Jam now, but perhaps in other ways not, um, which is to say that this question of um, giving, you know, a carte blanche um, to artists remains uh, a point of, of tension and anxiety, um, I think, in, inside of the space of the museum. Um, and I think, you know, what we're hoping to do with this kind of um, intentional folding of time, um, and the show is called 1974 to the Present, the gallery closed in 1986, um, is to index the ways that um, Jam lives amongst us um, in the show itself. Um, and so to kind of um, show the similarities of the kind of asymmetries that structure the gallery in relationship to other things that were happening with our time now. Um, and to, you know, acknowledge that the past is not some kind of static thing that we can recover, um, but is actually only animated um, through the voices of those who care for it in the present. Um, and so to kind of make that process of, of animation um, marked in some way, I, that's, that's abstract. Um, and I do hope that, you know, as, as Lynn has described it, like that is lived experientially inside of what people, ex you know, com come to the space and, and understand. And I think the biggest part of how that exists is to understand jam as an artwork. Right, I think that's what um, Linda has said that jam was an artwork. And so if we can consider its presentation in the present, it will be um, an aestheticized negotiation, um, hopefully. Just following up on Julia's question, it seems to me that one of the main roles of, the, of a curator is to think about the experience of the exhibition as both a temporal and non-temporal. Walk through an exhibition. Some work may be time based, which of course demands a certain amount. There are paths that you suggest by the, the way that you install, but people don't necessarily have to follow that. Um, and I just wondered whether you guys, the, the two of you, had any thoughts about uh, that in constructing an exhibition. Thomas, do you want to jump in? Sure. I mean, I think I have the advantage in being a performance curator in that all of these assumptions of, uh, you know, the, um, the kind of um, sequencing um, and movement across space is already like temporalized. It's already ex exists in time because you know, that performance is not always happening. Um, when you're experiencing it, you're 
you know, I think oftentimes like in a blur watching the Simone Forti, for example, like in which time period are you in as I'm describing something that happened two years ago that is itself looking back at the early 60s. And I think that's something that, you know, artists um, choreograph in, in their own work. Um, I'm, you know, thinking again about Carolee Schneemann's Meet Joy. And, you know, it's a work that lived many times when it was performed in the 64 and then just continued to live again and again and again in ways that she was the kind of um, architect of. Um, and I think, you know, the role of the curator hopefully is to kind of look at the ways that artists embed time into the existence of their works um and so like Helma Afklimt saying you know my work shall not be shown until x number of years after I'm dead as is another example um and then to, to kind of take the, those compressions of time as they're articulated by artists and then bring a viewer who's never heard of this person um, and offer them a way to kind of take that structure um, and, and spatialize it and, and how people come across with what they're seeing. Lynn, do you want to add anything? Yes, I think I'm, um, on the one hand, I find that with performance, ideally I'd always go twice. Um, seeing it the first time, I'm kind of settling down and getting into it and trying to figure out what's going on or, or where the where my focus is or how to filter it is always such a um, um, a complex thing that I find that um, only the second time do I really have uh, a sense of leisure. Um, some of the expectation is gone, but with that, there's more. Um, there's uh, a time to there's a time to get into it in a way that I often don't and can't on the first round, and I think that's um, perhaps why I don't work with performance very much. I I think that's a a kind of um, temporal failing. Um, I'm I'm also someone who quite often goes to an exhibition the second time if I've really liked it. I'm curious as to trying to take it apart um, as an exhibition and trying to look at it more uh, structurally or methodologically, how, how it's working, um, what's being, um, how, how the messages are being telegraphed. I'm, I'm interested in it um, in those terms, a kind of more meta reading. And um, sometimes it's it's more for the pleasure of looking at those works, certain works again. But I, I think that I guess the larger point I'd make is um, one can't uh, expect um, visitors to necessarily see what one's seeing. Um, inevitably, it's going to come through their own experiences and even the most um, experienced of viewers. Um, finds different things so that one may have a conversation with a friend um, about a show we've both seen and both loved and our, our readings are, are really quite different. And then with a more extended conversation, maybe we then see how in fact they're complementary or how they dovetail and that there is more commonality. But I think they um, not not everyone needs to look at exhibitions in these terms by any means. But since that's what I do or like to do in large part, um, thinking about how what what the protocols and methodologies and forms and uh, techniques available to make exhibitions is is part of the whole thing. I think. Thank you. We have another question and I sincerely apologize if I'm butchering people's names, but uh, from Naomi Remis, uh, who asked, the idea of provisional interpretation is fascinating. Since museums are often seen as presenters of facts, how do you convey that the presentation you are giving in your exhibitions are provisional and not mm -hmm. an hard and fast fact? So Thomas, would you like to start on that? 
Sure, I'm going to think on my feet, which is maybe part of the answer. Um, I think, you know, I think it, it goes to me like back to like that incursion of whatever, you know, this thing is in that in Zoe's image, which is to say um, that like there is not only somebody behind the making of a project, but there's actually many somebody's behind the making of a project. I think um, there can be a move towards like confessional autobiographical, you know, um, sign signing of a project. Um, and I actually think that that is just, uh, you know, one step. I think that the larger task that's really hard to do is, is to not just name and acknowledge the many people who go into making an exhibition because you know the other piece of working at a big place is that there are literally hundreds of people who um have their hands on an, on a show um but to reveal the kind of cultural values at play within a given place um not to indulge you know oneself because you know we can assume that maybe a viewer that won't necessarily care um but rather to try to create some kind of threshold um by which like you are aware of the conditions in which you're presenting what you're presenting and you know by um making either the great cultural capital that one has in that place or the imprimatur or the you know um the, the sense of um conviviality that exists in a sphere um acknowledged in some way usually sidelong right like something more oblique um but it could also be direct like just putting up you know this is our budget for the last year i think it is one way to mark the project as like coming from someplace that it emerges not only from a singular authorial position but from you know um a kind of ideological and a material reality um, that is informing what you're seeing and um, ultimately has some relationship to the broader world. Um, again, I'm, I guess I speak in abstraction, but I, I do think that, you know, there, there are very concrete ways um, that, you know, I think when we did Judson, um, you know, we, we try to um, acknowledge that it was a collective of people who had made that project happen by over and over and over again emphasizing in all the performances that we brought to the MoMA atrium um, that it was a collective um, of people who were individually making those performances and who had come together. Um, I think that's just one way of kind of telegraphing um, the conditions that, that make possible what it is that we make. And Lynn, I mean, I'm thinking that my first exhibition was when I was a student at the Whitney program, and we wanted to do what you sort of described, use the gallery as a critical space. And everyone said, no, no matter what you put it, it'll just be valorized and no one will see uh, that criticality. Um, I, I would echo some of the more abstract um, statements that Thomas was making, not the Judson, because not my project, but but in general, what you were saying, Thomas, but I would also underline the fact that an exhibition is temporary of its very nature. It's mm -hmm. only going to last a relatively short time and therefore is a propositional um, in, in the terms I see it. It's a proposal for a way of thinking about an artist's oeuvre or it's about a series of questions or it's what, whatever the specific topic of the show is. But that proposition has only the life of the three months or 10 weeks that it's on view. And even if it goes to another institution, it will be significantly different with the same checklist, um, both for all the reasons that Thomas gave about infrastructure, um, but also the histories uh, of the institution and the audiences and uh, the um, both material, literal and conceptual um, frameworks it, um, it takes. But in the, the exhibition therefore only lives on in memory. 
um, it may live on in some form of history, but exhibition histories are um, not an important part of the literature of art history uh, as yet. And uh, so it's going to live on mostly in memory. And um, memory is, is personal and uh, it uh, always is um, being remade in relation to ongoing life and experience. So I, I don't see how exhibitions can be anything but provisional. I think that the issues around um, uh, narratives being set in stone in institutions have a lot more to do with collection presentations and how they're, they're framed and uh, how long they stay up and uh, what kinds of, um, uh, histories within the institution they continue to reinforce or not. Thank you. We have a question from Luciana de Fatima Souza. How has the impact of racial issues in the US affected the choice of artists today? And how has the reaction of museum councils been? I assume means to a certain degree museum administration. Does either of you want to? I, I suppose I think it's impossible to generalize. Um, one can I mean, one can say something about one's own institution, perhaps, or or what one's observing in um, related institutions um, that one knows well. But but to speak to in more general terms, I I, I don't feel equipped. Um, other than to say, I think it, these are questions that preoccupies everyone in the field, but how they're being addressed and the terms and the specificities are not, uh, are, are very, very varied. And I, yeah, I would just add to that, that, you know, um, the moment that we are living in, um, you know, following the murder of George Floyd is one that um, I think is both, uh, you know, uh, the, the result of a long struggle within and beyond the art world. Um, so, you know, the kind of movement of Black Lives Matter outside of the art world and um, the, you know, the, the, um, the work of, um, art artists and our professionals of color. Um, so I say all that to say that, you know, I think what this moment perhaps offers is a, is a shift from like a politics of visibility and representation. In other words, looking towards numbers of artists or simply kind of selection of one person to stand in for a whole um, and rather a deeper exploration and self-examination of the kinds of values um, in, in terms of the kinds of typologies that Lynn mentioned at the very beginning, like the monographic versus the group exhibition or modes of collecting. Um, and I think that's just even like the first layer of um, the assumptions of you know, how museums operate that I think today more and more museums are real, realizing are deeply structured around you know, terms that have worked for white people in, in the United States, but just haven't necessarily meaningfully described the kinds of art made by, by others. And so, yeah, I think I, I just to repeat the kind of like, there is, there are all these alternative histories, like a, you know, a, a project like Outliers is, is important as a methodology because of the way that it offers these other kinds of um, modes of, of um, attending to um, history. And I think that that piece feels like what is in this moment, um, you know, being reckoned with that it's not just like, fill the slots with different names, but actually reorganize the way that the makeup and the allocation of resources is distributed. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. So this is from Rashida Witter and it asks, considering their boundless nature, how do you personally measure the success of an exhibition that you have curated and successes in square, scare quotes? 
maybe I'll just jump in so when you can have the last word. Um, thank you for the question, Rashid. I love that question. I would say, you know, it's something that when Lynn, you were talking about the, you know, the way in which exhibitions are always temporary um, that came to mind, which is, you know, for me, the sign of a, a really, um, a, an exhibition that has like taken risks and has been embracing failure and, and uncertainty and all these things, which I determined to be successful, um, is that you come out of the show with a sense of futurity. Like, you know, there's a sense that like, um, this will continue to matter. You're not sure about some of the ideas, like they're still unresolved for you. Um, you know, you will return to them. And I think, yeah, I just, you know, um, I think of this one passage in the Sigmar Polka show that Kathy Halbreich and Monka Tatters all organized at MoMA, where there was just this, you know, like black void. And to me, it was a placeholder for continuation. Um, and I just often think about that as I go about making shows of how do you mark um, that it's not a given that these artists had a show, because I think many of the artists I work with, it's not a given that a museum would ever be interested in their work. And so the sense of futurity well outside of the museum, but perhaps also um, enabled by the museum is, is what I you know, am moved by. And Lynn, would you like to? Um, I would say some of the things that Thomas has said about success being about um, what in retrospect, what, I don't want to paraphrase what you said, Thomas, but rather to say um, perhaps um, one realizes in retrospect or with further knowledge what might have been otherwise and um, the way in which it continues to bug one over time, um, the larger subject that it offers up different facets and not that one's going to have an opportunity to redo the show, but to see how um, maybe it, um, other people have found in subsequent exhibitions, closely related or not, ways of addressing what um, didn't in retrospect seem so clear or so productive or um, so nuanced. And, and so shifting ones, kind of having an ongoing dialogue in ways that then spill over into subsequent work. Um, so, it's, so it's kind of rumbling around. The best shows continue to, to rumble somehow uh, below the surface. Well, I want to thank you uh, both enormously for inviting us into your conversation and also giving us a peek into both the history of the exhibitions you've curated and previews of upcoming work, which we will all be hopefully able to attend in person in the next uh, couple of years. So I wish this is a little anticlimactic um, to have one person applaud, but uh, thank you and uh, good night, everyone.